Hey, bye everybody. We're back to playing. Uh, not playing, but I had to make another part for. I knew this was gonna be a long thing, but another part of my favorite non-superhero movies. This is part three. It wasn't supposed to be. Mostly it's supposed to be in part two, but uh, it was a put. Initially, I thought my entire file of all my stuff that is supposed to be in one little folder but it stopped after you know uh, when I was finished talking about Harry Potter so hopefully now it's working out so now the next uh, film that I enjoy growing up Disney's Hercules now this is now this is like a Disney fi interpretation of the uh, you know, the demigod of Hercules, where, like, uh, he, you know, the story, Her Hercules, boy, uh, born from the gods, uh, was kidnapped, raised, kind of like a Superman story, was raised on a farm, uh, by his, uh, adopted parents, with still a bit of strength, of his godlyhood strength left over, but, uh, James was as Hades. Still, he still voices Hades to this day. Uh, anytime they ask him to come in to voice Hades, he does it. He like he doesn't give no gripes about it. He's very good at that character. Cannot uh, fathom anybody else doing it. But everybody involved is great. I think this is like I don't know how you would rank Hercules songs up against. Somewhere like Aladdin and um, The Lion King. Because I believe it's up there with the, the gospel music and that Zero to Hero song is so good. And like Meg, don't even know if Meg should be considered a Disney princess because technically she's not a princess, but I mean, she's very good. I love like her spunky attitude. Uh, but this is like a Disney 5 version of Hercules. In normal interpretations, uh, Hera, who's supposed to be in this version, is his mother. But technically, because Greek gods got around, especially Zeus. So, he had Heracles out of wedlock. It wasn't through Hera. At least, that's how I recall the actual story. Because it's been times when Hercules and Hera are in like a heated battles because she keep trying to kill him because she he represents like a lot of uh kids that uh zeus sired uh through his uh lifetime of uh immortality with mortals she does everything she can to try to kill him but that's just i mean this version is just like a different interpretation they didn't want to uh, get this whole adultery thing in a kids movie, obviously. So, uh, but this one's fun still. It's probably my favorite interpretation of Hercules. Uh, uh, but if you ever played God of War and watched the Blood of Zeus on Netflix, which I do highly recommend you do see, it's, uh, little bit closer to the actual uh you know the whole real kind of uh strange kind of uh uh this Greek battle between you know gods and uh mortals and demigods because more than often than not gods couldn't keep them in their pants when it comes to other gods and especially mortals and always you know put the morals in eyes with certain gods like you know you, you hear all these stories about guys you know uh raining down wrath on mortals because they felt slighted in some kind of way but if that's your thing if you really like those kind of stories they're out there but i do like this more children uh, Disney five version. This one still holds up to me in my in in my opinion. I love the music, love the stories. It's part of the one that got me interested in like Greek mythology, to be honest. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of people feel the same way. 
And um, yeah. Oops, uh, I forgot to set up the hotkeys. Because I was so gung ho about getting started. Excuse me. Hocus Pocus. When you talking about a good Halloween movie, Hocus Pocus, I mean, like, it's dumb, but God help me, I love it so. You want know to talk about, like, you know, getting to the spirit of Halloween? You cannot go wrong with Hocus Pocus. I do want you guys to check this out. Because, in all actuality, people watch this movie because of these three women. Bette Midler, Sarah Michelle, uh, Michelle Geller, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy and Jimmy. They're, they're the ones who make this movie, honestly. The kids, you know, because they're, they're, they're the bad guys in this, but the kids involved that they're dealing with, you know, they, you know, the actors uh, that play the children are doing their jobs, but they are not the ones who draw us in. We like to see these three act of awful one another. They had a, they had a good time with one another. It's supposed to be a sequel to Hocus Pocus. Cannot wait to see that and see how that turns out. Hopefully, that is still on the table. When I was younger. Man, I was crushing hard on Sarah uh, Jessica Parker in that whole purple outfit because she is like, you know, she's a beautiful woman, but this movie really made her look just the whole Halloween gothic witch thing. Uh, this is like the bleach blonde hair. This is like that, that it really sold it. For a lot of people, like this is like the best she's ever looked in anything she had done afterwards or before. This is like a, a, a great role for Sarah Jessica Parker. Aside from um, the um, a Sex and the City stuff, this was like her, Bette Miller, and Kathy was just like are just playing off each other. They having a good time. We having a good time just watching them, and it's just so good. And still holds up to this day. Hollow Man. There's a couple of Invisible Man movies that are on this list. But Hollow, Hollow Man is probably like the... Besides the original, uh, original, original black and white version of the Invisible Man back in the day. Uh, this was like the modernized version of what the Invisible Man was growing up for me. Uh, aside from the memoirs of the Invisible Man, which is also on this list, I'll get to that soon. But uh, uh, we got the actor's name. Uh, cause Thanos is in this movie. Uh, the guy who played uh, Thanos and Cable. Uh, he's in this movie. At, like he was so young and well, not too young, but looked like he easily could be in his like uh mid-30s in this movie. But then Kevin Bacon, that was the name I was looking for. Kevin Bacon in this is just a phenomenal. I didn't put Tremors on this list. I think Hollow Man is like, oh, personally better than Tremors. But Tremors uh, is an honorable mention. It's a great film too, so you should check that out. But Hollow Man is a great film where pretty much like scientists invented, invented invisible technology. Or at least created like a serum or substance when injected, turns you invisible, but just they never figured out how to uh, successfully make the antidote to turn a human back. You know, they tested it on like an ape. It worked successfully of getting to the invisible stage and then back to the visible stage. But as Kevin Bacon, who plays the invisible man in this movie, you know, gone crazy because they couldn't successfully bring him back. And it's like a true horror movie based on like these classic horror monsters you placate to their psyche or at least the environment around them uh, he cannot be visible he cannot be seen and he's an ego you got already an egocentric guy He, you can see that all the beginning of the film 
up to the point of the invisible stage. And the fact that now he not only thinks he's God, he can you feel like he can be God by just doing whatever he wants because nobody can see him. But then it also turns against his favor because with him being so egotistical, it's like I cannot fully enjoy this without nobody knowing it's me. And it's kind of like it's at odds with each other. But I love this film. And Kevin Bacon, you know, plays this role phenomenally. Uh, uh, it gets gory at times. Not too gory, not like slasher or anything like that. But it has its gory moments. So just forewarning you. So yeah, I highly do recommend checking this out. Home Alone 1 and 2. Now, this... Uh, you're talking about Christmas movies. Die Hard and Home Alone really represent Christmas movies. It's still... This dude's a little cycle. And it's like... Man, it's like uh, Macaulay Culkin. It's phenomenal, but man. He had a little brief time when he was not like in the right headspace. Because like, when you got that famous so young... And you shouldn't be surprised how uh, wild you might turn out in your later years. He's all right now. And I'm pretty sure he should be, you know, should be getting more roles. I mean, I mean, a couple of years ago, he uh, uh, did his little goofy little uh, skit that was on uh, social media for a while. This funny thing where he's like in the back of the car and like smoking and it's like, He's so traumatized. And you're talking to like a Lyft driver or something like that. Like, you ever got left home four days? Your parents, like, you know, uh, uh, not knowing what you're gonna do, and and like, you got you got fight off criminals in your own house and kind of thing. It'll kind of mess you up as a kid, wouldn't it? You should see it. Check it out online. I mean, it's hilarious. He really like he respects the role and the, all the people who love him in it. And because that really made his stardom, I really want uh, Macaulay Culkin to get more work. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's working, but it's like kind of want to like to get back into it if he wants to do it. It's like you know, not fortunate people's hands because it's like some people, celebrity, you know, to their side of things, probably not always always that cracked up to be. But Home Alone one and two are like very good Home Alone movies. Uh, me personally, like, you know, stuff doesn't really get cracking until he starts setting up those traps and using it on those criminals. That's when things really get good, in my opinion. I'm sorry. Like, everything prior to that is just like, you know, okay. Like, I've seen this a thousand times, so, like, I know all the bits and lines and dialogue and all the other stuff. But I want to get to the real good stuff, the meat and gritty of it. But all in all, if your kids haven't seen it, if you got kids, show them this movie, especially around the holidays. It's a really good movie. And, of course, you got to, like, uh, you know, check it out every ho uh, uh, holiday. It's a great film. And Lost in New York is you know, it's pretty much the same thing, but in a different city. And then the first one is, is uh, based in Chicago. It's supposed to be based in Chicago. I think the house is somewhere. I forgot what part in uh, Illinois not Springfield, maybe uh, uh, somewhere in the ritzy neighborhoods when a house is like that freaking big. I don't know what the heck does the uh, his parents do to afford that house that huge to have that many rooms because like all those people don't live there. They was together and you know visiting each other for the holidays to go on this trip because they have the biggest house and the house a lot of these relatives. But when they're gone, you mean tell me that. You know, him, I'm pretty sure he has a sister too, but he has a big brother, Bud. And then those two parents, it's like, this house is too big for just four or five people. It's like, what do you do for a living, man? But anyway, this is nitpicking, but just I love Home Alone. It's a great movie. Hook, Robin Williams again. Man, Hook is like, uh, man. And with uh, America's Favorite Smile, uh, uh, Julia Roberts as Tank, that was pretty good. This, this could easily could have been like a, 
uh, a horror movie they want it to be because like yeah like a crazy pirate traveling to a different world kidnapping your kids and it's like it, they placated the uh the spookiness about it you know a little bit uh, at the beginning but uh yeah Robert Williams is Peter Pan and it's like two Disney movies he's involved in. I think he, well, he was involved in Flubber too. But like, man, Disney love their Robin Williams because like, you know, he like really uh, played to the, uh, his comedic strength in this movie. And I, I enjoyed him in it. I watched this a thousand times. You got like uh, Rufio, Zuko himself, the Fire uh, Lord, Zuko as uh, 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 Rufio. Rufio, Rufio, Rufio. Man, you know, uh, like, it, it, I, I kid you not, I was like, it was like a couple of years ago when I realized that actor who was Rufio was the same dude as Zuko in Avatar. It's like, I didn't even know. I didn't put two to two together. I think it was two or three years ago when I just realized that, or at least come to that uh, realization. Because that's just wild to me. Uh, but yeah, it's crazy. I, I love Hook. It's a great, probably the best Peter Pan movie of all the other interpretations of Peter Pan besides from the animated original Disney one. This is probably the more successful live action version uh, compared to uh, anything else that came after it. As the, if you want to show your kids a good Peter Pan movie, is this movie and the original Disney uh, animated version that you can easily see on Disney+. Plus. Those two are the best Peter Pan movies. The only two that you probably should let your kids see. Everything else is not that good. Horrible Bosses. Oh man, I've watched this almost like like every other couple of weeks. I feel like because I uh, this is like a funny movie and raunchy when it wants to be. There's a raunchy version of this, unrated. But uh, three uh, characters: Jason Bateman, Charlie Day, and Jason Sudeikis plays uh, these three people who have. Uh, each have like a crappy boss uh, for different reasons. Uh, Jason Bateman has like Kevin Spacey as like this working as this kind of firm that he was just like some sadistic person. Like gives, of course, like I mentioned about like uh, people working in corporate, like my American Psycho brief uh, discussion about that movie. It's like you gotta have some level of uh, sociopathy to you when um, when you work in like a business or something like that, and like the empathy is just like very low to non-existent in some cases, and it's like they placate that very hard. Uh, they placate that very hard in uh, in this uh, character. Charlie Day has probably like the most hottest version of uh jennifer aniston I'm like she like plays this like temptress it's like this a lustful uh you know sex addict kind of uh act uh character who tries to harass who's pretty much sexually harassing charlie day's character trying to get him, him to sleep with her because he pretty much sleeps with everybody and like he's with his uh fiance and then she kept hounding him. Was like, then you check out the movie. It's you know it's hilarious. And I, can, I don't want to spoil what she does because it's so funny and messed up. But that's her role. And then you got Jason Dick is working off of uh, uh, Colin Farrell, who plays this like coke head uh, son of this boss who kind of took over the business and. Uh, just trying to run this company on the ground, and they all trying to, they can't get out. I mean, realistically, there's other ways to get a new job, but they just, it's a comedy. So there's no way for them to get out of the stuff, or they don't want to start over at a new job and work from the ground up again. So they uh, uh, try to plan out with 
Jamie Foxx, who's also in this, trying to uh, plan a, a ways to kill their bosses without getting caught, so their lives would be easier. So, uh, then there's a sequel. They actually have, like, Chris Pine with... Uh, I forgot the actor's name, but he's in a lot of stuff. He's very good, too. Uh, he plays off of, uh, he plays one of uh, Jane, Jane, Daniel Craig's James Bond's villains. Uh, but uh, I forgot his name. But in the sequel, they're the new bosses they need to try to get rid of. But uh, yeah, there's horrible bosses. A great uh, part one and then part two. Great films. Highly recommend checking them out. They're so hilarious. And it's just like, you know, these three are just phenomenal. I didn't think they was going to make a successful second one. I don't know how you make a sequel off the first one, but they made it happen. I still enjoyed it, but uh, uh, I don't see that my I don't see them making a third one. Unfortunately, because I don't know how you can even make that happen a third time without them ending up in jail. Because it's too much of a pattern now. Because they, you know, they should have been in jail and uh, in the first one. It was just amazing. Uh, at least you know, in my interpretation, it's like you lucked out big time is the fact that you know your goofiness is kind of bailing you out almost but yeah check out Horrible Bosses it's a great comedy film now yeah Hotel Transylvania uh, I mentioned this brief, uh, briefly in my uh, review with like a bunch of Adam Sandler films and I tell you if you look at Mavis right there the dark haired girl right there man she, like, you know, really brings out, like, that golf crush in me. It's like, these, uh, like, going to be nice, man. These you know, the golf girls are, like, hot. I don't know why this speaks to me in some twisted level. But it's like, man, it's just like that whole witch vampire golf look just, like, really gets me every freaking time. And it's like when a girl, especially when you see, like, girls wearing those thigh high socks that's, like, black and white. And like really the dark hair, and it really placate to that you know, that goth look. It's like mm, that does it for me. I don't know why that does it for me. That's just like it's like on a level of like uh, fishnet stockings that does it for me too. It's just like it's just certain outfits that just work for women, and it's just like really gets me. But this movie, it pretty much like you know, sound like a goofy version of like uh, like Hotel Transylvania was basically a hotel with a bunch of monsters. Of course, Adam Sandler has to be the Dracula. He's the lead in this. And then uh, you got uh, JC, uh, uh, Andy Samberg. I was about to say Jesse Eisenberg. Andy Samberg as like uh, Mavis's love interest in this. But yeah, every actor involved uh, in this is very good. I love it. Part two, Hotel Transylvania 2, is very good as well. Uh, they made a third one too, and I think there was like a TV show. I didn't watch the third one. I think there was a fourth one too. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it was like a fourth one, hundred percent. But anything after Hotel Transylvania two, I did not watch. It, like, cause pretty much it turned to one of those goofy everyday kind of cartoons that you just sit your kid in front of, just because they have like uh, the because a lot of people complain about this with the Benedict Cumberbatch uh, Grinch film is that. You, it's a lot of quick movements, zigzaggy uh, uh, cartoon characters that like pretty much jangle keys in front of your kid just to keep their attention. And as you know, it wasn't like that in the first two movies until it started slowly transitioning into that. Because uh, when you see like in the first movie, Dracula move in this particular style, you know, just like. You can tell a person's, uh, you know, usually you can tell a person a lot about them, about the way they walk and move. There's a certain way, you've seen the first movie, a certain way that Dracula walks in the first movie compared to him now in, you know, Hotel Transylvania 3 when he's more like bippity and bopping around, zipping and zapping, just just like every other cartoon character, like Horton Here's a Who stuff or any other, like, uh, like the Lorax kind of cartoons is like, you know, same old stuff that's just to keep your kids' attention. There's no purpose to it no more. It's just like you, you're just losing 
all that uh, we liked about in the original. But if you want to just something you want to watch with your kids, watch the first two, first two Hotel Transylvania movies. But anything after that, uh, if you feel like you want to watch it with your kids, you can. But the rest is just something like you just keep your kids' attention. You don't need to be around that because, you know, it loses like it's like a spark in a way. Not that it's not good. I cannot say it won't be good. If you watch it, it's not going to hurt nobody. It's just that personally, like the story quality is like it. it like uh, the first two actually, you know, you know, you it resonated in a way uh, that the others kind of like lose something. It was like something was like I like I said, I said uh, like a spark was missing a little bit in the after two. Yeah, hotel transfer two. House Party. Now, House Party, now you're talking about like, this represents 90s through and through. Like, you, the way they dress, the music, Kid and Play were like, you know, I want to say the kings of the 90s, but they, you know, they represent the 90s very well. Uh, House Party 2 was cool. But the first house party one, uh, it holds up very well. Uh, Kid and Play were phenomenal. Of course, the late Robin Harris, Martin Lawrence was in this. Uh, it's it's crazy, like you know, seeing Martin Lawrence in this compared to his like his uh, evolution through the years. He got a little thick, you know, recently. Uh, not like fat or anything like that, but you, you know. He packed on a bit of pounds, but he's like a twiggy, twiggy little guy in this. It's crazy. And then uh, you got like Tisha Campbell uh, in this as well. You got Lily Martin and Gina in the same movie. It's, you know, it's so funny that way. But, you know, Tisha Campbell really, she knows how to dance, man. It was like, you know, and she still do. But it's crazy. Like, you know, she like got down this. I'm pretty sure she was like a fly girl in, the, in Living Color. I could be wrong. It was either her or Jennifer Lopez. But I keep confusing the two. But I'm pretty sure it was Tisha Campbell that was a fly girl in the, in Living Color. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah. But in Living... Uh, I mean, in Living Color. Watching Living Color too is very good. But uh, House Party... Uh, definitely a highly recommendation. If you haven't seen House Party, so funny. Uh, it holds up all, all these years. It's like one of those, one of the greats. Inception, uh, another Leo DiCaprio movie. Also, Joseph Gold, Joseph Gordon Levitt, uh, and Joseph Gordon Levitt is like a phenomenal actor in his own right too. It, like I said, it wasn't until like a couple of years ago when I realized that. This dude was a little kid in Angels in the Outfield, the star of Angel in the Outfield next to Christopher Lloyd. You're like, are you joking? It's like, I don't know why I did not put two and two together like that. And they got the same face and that same grin. They got this, it's a particular grin that Joseph Gordon Levitt has that fits him so well. And it's like, you got that grin about you that only you have that's just particularly yours that, you know, it's just like, yeah, that's Joseph Gordon Lennon. That's how he looks. That's how he smiles. Him, Tom Hardy, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan, Leto Cario. This movie, man, was incredible. I didn't see it in the theaters. Because, uh, I don't know. You know, this was like, I guess, like right after Dark Knight. Uh, it's right where uh, Christopher Nolan really uh, showed his stuff. Like, yeah, like Pinnacle... Christopher Nolan, when he was like really like making himself like a well-known uh, upper echelon kind of director, and um, I watched this uh, only several times on TV, and it's an incredible movie. And what they was able to him to do, because I think they actually had to build a lot of like literally like a whole area like uh, inside a building to show of. Uh, a street folding in on itself, but then Doctor Strange came around. And it's like, oh, hold my beer! I can take that and multiply it by kaleidoscope. 
But yeah, Inception, great movie. It was, uh, I don't want to spoil too much, but it's pretty much like the whole be able to get inside a person's dream and manipulate it uh, for your own ends. Uh, you know, it, it is just a very good storytelling, very interwoven, totally Christopher Nolan style, and it's just uh, phenomenal. I love Inception's great film. The Indiana Jones franchise. Now, I left off the last one because I tried to find one that didn't have Crystal Skull. Because the Crystal Skull suck. Do not waste your time watching it if you did not see it before. Because those who have all agree it sucks. It does suck. Just watch the first three Indiana Jones movies. They're incredible. Highly regarded. Personally, I like... Uh, the Last Crusade with him and um, the late Sean Connery, him and Harrison Ford playing off each other was fantastic. Uh, my father told me that after he named me after him because I'm a junior myself, he named me after him because he liked The Last Crusade. I guess he liked The Last Crusade so much he named me after him because just like, you know, he wanted a junior too. So that was like, a cool thing. And we had this game as a kid when I was a little. He's like, every time he, for a while, he was like, Junior. I was like, Yes, sir. Like, you know, that, that was like a fun for a little while. That was, it was like our thing. Because, like, like I said, like before, a lot of these movies I watched with my father growing up as a kid. I have like a love for movies and TV shows and cartoons and anime, stuff like that. It, mostly because of my father and for the most part, my uncle. Matter of fact, a lot of people in my family, like, you know, had a fair share of love for a film, because my cousins got me into, like, Harry Potter, my, uh, uh, father got me the bulk of the films that I love got me into it, and, uh, and him and my uncle. So it's like, you know, I have a reverence for this movie. Uh, Indiana Jones, you know, really placates to the, the adventure, uh, adventurer, uh, uh style of cinema, cinema, uh, uh, like the Mummy movie, which I'll get to, play Kate to that same thing, just like that young adventurer kind of thing. That was fun, fighting Nazis and and saving the damsels in distress, and you know, uh, you know, uh, well, he was grave robbing technically, so it was against the law. But even though he was trying to, you know, rescue it away from Nazis and other more dangerous grave robbers, just to you know, give it to a museum, but there's more paperwork involved into that. This is it's like a whole thing. I mean, there's other videos that delve deep into the realism of archaeology, but uh, Indiana Jones did make that fun and kind of that and Jurassic Park make, you know, science fun. They make history and science fun, and you cannot take that away from them. So, uh, next one. Uh, Interview with the Vampire, another Keanu Reeves movie that where he plays the villain. With Brad Pitt, another Antonio Vanderas movie, and Christian Slater, and a very, very young Kristen Dunst. It's wow. It's like it's wild just to see uh uh like you know, certain young actors before they become stars. But this one is like an incredible vampire movie, a true vampire movie. Not let Twilight BS. I cannot stand Twilight. Uh, the first time I watched the first Twilight movie, is I was trying to impress a girl, at the t my ex at the time. And, you know, because, like, you know, most girls, you know, convince guys to watch stupid movies. I was trying to get some, and I was like, all right, it might be a vampire, might be a, one of the stupidest vampire movies with sparkly vampires, but I'll suck it up for an hour and a half just to get some later. So... Uh, I sucked it up, but that's not true vampires to me. Dracula Untold, Interview with a Vampire, Blade. These are true vampire movies. They're creatures of the night, and they should be respected as much. But, you know, you know, sure, sunlight affects them, but they don't make them sparkly. They turn to dust. It kills them. They're, it's that kryptonite. It's supposed to be that way. It's always been that way. But Interview with a Vampire is just pretty much like uh, Brad Pitt, uh, 
modern 19 late mid 19 mid to late 1990s uh talking to this interview with christopher slater going over his life as a vampire uh and his uh interactions with the stock played by uh tom cruise and tom cruise was phenomenal as this uh just uh sadistic vampire or at least you know you know uh, no different than any other vampire you see in most media, but it's just like he enjoyed the nightlife of the vampire, killing who he wants, and trying to convince because Brad Pitt's character still maintain a bit of a soul and trying to like not become a monster. But while Tom Cruise's character Lestat embraced the monster in his own way, but still maintain a level level of like class about it in a way when he plays up the class he plays it up but then when it's feeding time uh, that's when he just like goes full force with it and like you know it, it, it's he's great in this everybody is greatness uh and a lot of people seen like uh him brad pitt and antonio banderas as vampires a lot of girls is like shoot bite me kind of feel like if you're a girl and you've watched this movie that you never, if you've never seen this movie and you watch this movie, I'm telling you right now, when you see Antonio Banderas, you already know he's like a handsome dude, but when you see him as like a vampire and his panties are dropping. I'm telling you that right now. There you go. I've been waiting to get to this. The Invisible Man uh, came out. Uh, I've watched this in a movie. No, I didn't watch this in the movie theater. I watched this on streaming. Uh, it's kind of like. I don't like horror like that, but I was interested in seeing The Invisible Man, but not in the movie theater. Because I am still was in the mindset of like how bad the Mummy reboot with Tom Cruise was, uh, was, and I was a little worried about this, but there was a uh, buzz around how good it is because they actually, you know, decided to, Universal decided, okay, that's make this uh, just like a visible man movie. Don't try to make it like a whole universe. It's trying to make a, 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 a successful movie on its own right. Which they should have done from the beginning. You, When you're trying to rush, trying to catch up to uh, Marvel, who had several years of a head start through trial and error uh, to you know, be able to have it down to a science, and you're trying to uh, cut corners around that, of course you was going to fail. They uh, set, you know, a pathway because you didn't want to, you know, the universe was just like DC. Didn't want to feel like they're copying Marvel. And I was like, dude, they put in place a blueprint that you can just follow. Nobody's going to blame you for following the same model. Give each character their own movie that's about their own stuff in this particular movie, wherever they're dealing with, and then seed uh, each one with an interconnected thing between each other. That's what they did, and it worked. There's nothing wrong with that. You trying to cut a corners around it, of course, it's going to fail. Now they caught on to what we've been screaming at them. But the Visible Man movie, definitely check it out. It's incredible. It's pretty much like, like a, it's like it's like when Ant Man is just not only a superhero movie, it's also a heist movie. So they pretty much made this horror movie, uh, more so like a thriller, but you know, horror thriller, and, and also combined it with about like uh, abuse, and and it's like it's, it's a great great idea. And, and that made it even more interesting. So, if you're not queasy, definitely check this out. Uh, it's uh, very good. It was on Amazon Prime last time I saw, so you can probably still check it out. So, yeah, very good. It's a Wonderful Life, another highly recommended movie. I love this one. I didn't see it last year uh, because I was watching so much. Christmas movies and I was working at the time it was like and streaming I didn't be able to sit down and watch everything I wanted to watch 
on a holidays that I normally do, but I did watch it enough to know what it is. Or at least I watched it so many times years prior that it's like, you know, I, I'm not too big of a deal if I missed out on one year to actually watch it. It's not like I don't, or at least not able to watch it anytime I want to, I can. It just feels different when you're watching it during the holidays compared to you doing it during the summertime. It's just... Is there certain movies that you've watched in a particular holiday or a particular time of year that means more than you do any other time of the year? Pretty much the story of a man who's contemplating suicide because he feel like his life is falling apart and an angel pretty much told him his life, what, what his life would be like if he wasn't ever born, pretty much like give him a different perspective. Because... You know, this is like a good movie. I always talk to a couple of friends about this. This movie, I mean, it's not too cheesy. It's just like a good movie to show people that, like, uh, like who ever contemplated suicide or anything like that. This is a good suicide prevention kind of movie. It's like, no matter what your circumstances are, your life doesn't mean nothing. It, uh, I mean, your your life does mean something, because as human beings, we all interacted with the you know with one another in some kind of way. We we reached out to people in ways that we don't even realize and might have bear fruit into their lives and kind of as a domino effect affected somebody else. It's like in one scene. Wow, well, I don't want to spoil anything. You have to watch. Uh, is one of a life. You know what I mean when it's like uh, you affected others, they end up infected others, they end up affected others in ways that you cannot imagine that it's like a puzzle piece or a house of cards. You remove one thing that built it, to help build this foundation, everything comes crashing down and it's like you're that piece and you, you are, your life, you're, uh, Despite whatever kind of hand you're dealt with when you're born into this world, you can make something of it. There's, and you have resources, people that can you can reach out to and talk to. If you're feeling down or like if life is uh, pulling you in all different directions and you're feeling unglued, you have, if you have like children or you have a wife or husband or relative, good resources, not anybody who's exploiting you or anything like that. We have some friends, we have co-workers that you can talk to, or like even go to like a doctor or, you know, somebody who can just sit down and then you can just have a moment with and just, you know, unburden yourself with. So you, know, you might look out and they might be able to extend you a helping hand or, you know, just to give you a sort of crown and let you know like you're worth something. You are worthy of this thing called life. No matter how bad it is, and it can get difficult, yes, but don't lose yourself or throw that life away uh, uh, because something got, you know, a certain moment in your life got hard. Or at least, you know, some compounding factors, you know, made things more difficult than you uh, needed it to be. But that's the whole point of a wonderful life. That's why I enjoy it so much. It's, it's something that is, it resonates with a lot of people. 007. Oh, man. I had to put the entire collection of James Bonds. I have my favorite James Bond films, but I had to acknowledge all the great James Bonds over the years. Personally, there's always people saying, like, James Bond, uh, James Bond's, uh, uh Yes, he, in to a certain extent, is like a bad character. Not in a way like he's a bad guy, but just like, you know, a misogynist and uh, kind of like a male chauvinist fantasy. But like your dad's, you know, kind of uh, hero compared to like some like Ethan Hunt in those Mission Impossible films. He's like more realistic take on spies. But I have my fish of love for James Bond a little bit over Ethan Hunt. I like Ethan Hunt in the Mission Impossible movies, but James Bond, at least a few of the James Bonds I have connection with. I grew up with Pierce Brosnan 
in the 90s as my James Bond, than Daniel Craig. But uh, I've seen the past James Bond films as well with my grandfather, but, you know, only Sean Connery uh, kind of like uh, still maintains as like one of my favorite Bonds. Uh, Roger Moore and like uh, Dalton and, and the other guy, you know, they good. They're good, but it's like I'm, you know, n there's not my bonds. Connery, Daniel Craig, and Pierce Brosnan are my favorite bonds of all time. And Goldeneye still probably upper echelon of great films. Uh, Goldeneye, great video game too. Which is, I'll get to that when I do my favorite list of video games of all time. But uh, Casino Royale, Skyfall, uh, uh. uh uh, yeah, uh, the world is not enough. Uh, you just, you know, it's just like great films. I love those films. Uh, yeah, just you know, you know, everybody got their favorite bonds. Please let me know what your favorite James Bond is. Uh, and if you have a favorite James Bond film, please let me know. But you know, James Bond is just still like critically acclaimed in my book as far as like, you know, he, despite how you feel about the idea of James Bond or the character of James Bond, he is a touchstone in the film franchise uh, for several decades and reached different people throughout the years. You cannot give him his, um, you gotta give him his just due as a character. So, yeah. Highly recommend watching a lot of the James Bond films. Gotta get some water for this. This is what I've been waiting for. Jim Carrey. Oh, man. I love every Jim Carrey film. Anything he's in, he's phenomenal in. Of course, I have my particular favorites, but I could not leave stuff out. So I just figured I could make a collage just talking about Jim Carrey as a whole. Of course, my favorites. Ace Ventura. He's my... I love him as the Riddler in um, Batman Forever. Bruce Almighty. Truman Show. Moons of Irene. Uh, the cable guy, liar, liar. Uh, he was in Living Color, of course. Uh, yeah, Fire Marshal Bill, The Mask. Uh, um, man, it's just like the the Grinch. Uh, there's so much he's been in, and he has so much comedic chops. His impressions are just uh, incredible, and we all. As kids, we all watched a lot of uh, Jim Carrey films, and we all, a lot of them, a lot of us tried to imitate uh, everything he done in films. Come on, like you cannot tell me you haven't not tried to imitate him as, as Stanley Ipkiss, The Mask, or Ace Ventura. At least those two in particular that we all tried to imitate, because this was so. Funny, I mean, this guy is so funny, and like, and and of course he did his dramatic stuff, like, uh, 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 uh crap, it's like other dramatic stuff he's been in, but uh, he also been like one scary uh, thing, uh, kind of scary, uh, the number twenty three, because you want to branch, he want, he was at that point, and it's like when you want to branch out and do other stuff uh, beyond just comedy. Which he can do. The Truman Show was like a perfect example of that. But he did uh, Andy Kaufman uh, 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 role. I that's probably one of my least favorite Jim Carrey stuff. I didn't really care for it. Or I watched the Number Twenty Three. Didn't really care for it. But Dumb and Dumber and like that. That's, that's I mean, of course I love his comedy stuff. It's like that's you know you know I don't have to. Uh, Harp on that, obviously, but it's just like uh, by ratio, it just seems like uh, uh, there's only a f you know a couple of dramatic stuff that I enjoyed him in compared to all his comedic stuff that I enjoyed him a lot more in. But he is a phenomenal actor, one of my favorite actors of all time. I hope one day to meet this dude. He has autograph telling him how much I love his work and like I watched him in Living Color and like everything he's been in has just been so good and hilarious and it's like it's just 
he's just the greatest. And like, please let me know which is your favorite Jim Carrey movie. Uh, which one you uh, liked in the most in favorite character? Uh, you know, it's just great. Okay, Jingle All the Way, another uh, Christmas movie. This one is like a good t uh, discussion video that you can have about capitalism in a way, I guess. Like, who hasn't gone out their way to try to go through a crazy amount of people trying to fight that one particular toy or game that's been like all the rage amongst everybody? And it's like, because literally, I'm still going to have to, well, I wanted the PS5 and the Xbox Series S during the last year around the holidays, but it was like a pain in the butt to get, no joke. But uh, you know, it's been like other times when our parents had to go out of the way trying to find a particular doll or action figure or video game, and it was like a madhouse sometimes. This represents, takes that to a whole nother level of play case that uh, feeling. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is great in this you know him and Sinbad is just like so funny in this and just like you don't you get the reference when somebody says it's turbo time you know they're talking about this movie uh uh it's just it's just great it is a great film I love it I watch it every year and it's like one of the few uh hilarious um Arnold Schwarzenegger roles that I think I don't, I'm not sure if this is his first comedic role outside any action film he normally is in, but yeah, this is great. Uh, this is Arnold, you know, just showing off, you know, different level of skill beyond just you know punching things, you know, or shooting things. But yeah, Jingle All the Way, great film. Definitely highly recommend watching this during the holidays. It's, you know. Your parents are probably, well, if you're a kid and your parents, you live with your parents, your parents probably love it if they've never seen it before. Or if you're a parent yourself, watch it with your kid. Great family film. John Wick Collection. Man, I'm telling you, Keanu Mother Effin Reeves just is a phenomenal human being. Like, this really, like, it's like, not like the calories was like in like a downward spiral or anything like that, but the first John Wick movie people slept on, didn't think nothing of it. It was like, oh, calories is doing a role, it's nothing big deal. But then word got around, I was like, oh my god, you gotta see this John Wick movie. Like, calories was kicking ass this whole dog on time, it was like amazing. And it's like, I watched it, it was already out of like the theaters by the time word got around to me, or at least I cut on any interest. I watched it on TV, and it's like, Holy shit. There's like 90% of that first movie was headshots. I was like, holy crap. Like, dude, kicking on a lot of people's asses. Like, no one gives zero fucks about Keanu Reeves. And it's, I mean, Keanu Reeves don't give zero fucks about anybody. Anybody around him was like, oh my God. You know. And then have, he calling him the Baba Yaga, the boogeyman. And like, one of the gangsters in the first one was like, he's the one who you sent to kill the fucking boogeyman. And like, oh my god. And then it's like, uh, then um, Dion Greyjoy, I don't know the actor's real name, but the Dion Greyjoy from Game of Thrones, he's in the first one. Like, you know, I mean, it's in the trailers, and you know, the first John Wick movie came out a long time ago, but Dion Greyjoy ended up killing his dog that was gifted to John Wick uh, by his late wife uh, that he was trying to mourn. And this little shit stain broken his house, stole his car, and killed his dog. Every animal lover just, like, fully on board with uh, Count Reed just murdering anybody in his dog on way. But the world that they built, you know, really made this hit home. So it's like, uh, his father telling him, like, it's not what you did that angers me, son. It's who you did it to. And it's like, uh, he was an associate of ours. I once seen him kill uh, a room full of people with a pencil or something like that. Uh, and it's like uh, I gave him an impossible task. And the bodies he buried laid the foundation of what we are today. And like, 
and you killed his fucking dog. And it's like, and then each sequel built off of that. It's like, it feels like it happens either days or uh, or at least a week after the last film. It's like running linear toward each other. I cannot wait for the fourth John Wick film. I thought the third one was going to be like a wrap-up, like a good, solid, uh, complete story. But nah, man. Nah. Uh, uh, they're going to make a fourth one. Maybe the fourth one's going to be the last one. I don't know how it might end. Part of me feels like they might end up killing John Wick after this whole franchise is over. Uh, so I guess in a way he can be with his like wife, but I kind of wish he, you know, lives through all this stuff. But man, is the John Wick, the entire franchise, definitely highly recommend it. Definitely you should watch it if you haven't seen Keanu Reeves at his Keanu Reeves. Uh, so good in this. I need you guys to please check it out if you have not seen it. John Wick. Uh, all three, check it out. Just it it took action films to a whole nother level, and everybody needs to try to get on that level. The only other movie that probably gotten close to that is most because this is Deadpool, the first Deadpool movie, and that's most because people who worked on that movie also worked on this. So that's probably why it's probably the closest one that got to the level of action and like you know. Uh, uh, to that same level. So yeah. John Wick. Uh, the Judge. Now this is uh, something that you probably not have heard of. But you know. Robert Duvall. Robert Downey Jr. This is like right. Uh, I'm pretty sure right around the same time as Infinity War. But this is like. You know. Robert Downey Jr. You know. Uh, just trying to stretch his. Uh legs outside the Iron Man armor a bit and trying to in a way beyond Sherlock Holmes trying to like uh, get his foot back into other roles beyond the MCU because this is around the time when he's just like almost done with the whole entire franchise which is well deserved he earned his exit out and man did he earn it but we'll get to that once we go through my list of favorite Marvel films in another video but yeah, the judge pretty much uh, a lawyer, son of a judge, had this who's estranged from each other, uh, trying to uh, 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 represent his judge father in like a, a murder case. So those whole uh, family dynamics uh, uh, ensues, uh, like all this unsaid grievance that they have amongst each other is like the emotion and like uh the uh the involving each of these characters is like you ever have like a like a ornery uh grandfather or father that's like you're a grown man yourself and you're trying to talk sense to your father and it's like you're button heads and like he's still treating you like a kid or at least you know ain't showing you any kind of love or either love and or respect uh, as such and, if, and it feels like uh, you can't win it's like you'll, you'll get that kind of feeling when you watch this uh, movie and it's just it's really good and I highly recommend it Jumanji another Robin Williams film man I don't have the sequels or at least the uh, supposed sequels, remakes, or whatever of the Kevin Hart rock version of Jumanji movies. I don't really care for those, to be honest with you. I can see why people like it, but I checked out their version of Jungle Book, where it's like video game. I guess it's supposed to be like a, a long sequel after the first one. But I like the idea of a board game. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, this board game who's I, I kind of want like an origin story of how this game was made because I feel like uh, this game was pretty much like uh, comes alive in a way it's like you uh, and when you start playing this game it forces you to continue to play until somebody wins the game in the meantime 
all these animal dangerous animals and hunters and uh all these different uh plants coming out of this game trying to kill you or anything around you it is it's just like uh uh it's intense and all the while you're trying to finish this uh game it's very cool it's one of my favorite uh Robert Williams films but uh yeah but they're sequels. They're long, long after years sequels with Kevin Hart and The Rock. Because Kevin Hart and The Rock got to be in everything together almost. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's okay. The sequel was okay. And it's like, it's kind of, but the only interesting thing I found uh, from that is just like, okay, this board game somehow, you know, forces itself magically somehow into from a board game to a video game to fit uh, an ideal way to get someone to play you because all these you know drum beats entices people to come to you to play and it's like okay what is this origin story of this Jumanji game there needs to be a movie uh, matter of fact it's another Chris and Dunstan movie as a matter of fact uh, young Chris is done. It was probably long after an interview with the vampire. But anyway, uh, who created a game? What was his original uh, state before it evolved into something like a board game and then a video game? Because it probably has to evolve into a type of game that is most known to be played during a certain period, a, a certain time period. Because, of course, nobody plays necessary board games all that often in modern times. It's more so video games. So it makes sense to evolve in itself into that to entice somebody to play it. But during the 90s, people played board games a lot more often than video games. Because video games was like not a niche thing, but it's not like uh, it's not a colossal, colossal juggernaut as it is now. But what was it prior to a board game? That's something I want to see that the original, like, that's, that's something I want to like uh, very much an idea of like where did this Jumanji board game come from originally? That's something I really want to know, and that'd be an interesting movie to have more so than this uh, Chris Rock, not Chris Rock, uh, The Rock and Kevin Hart, you know, because when them together, it's just like a running the mill Kevin Hart movie. It, it's if you like it, that's fine. It doesn't really sink in with me. I don't really enjoy it all that well. But uh, I do recommend this Jumanji game. And check it out. It's very fun. And might get you back into want to play some more board games with your family, which is good. It's, you're in the house and you're probably quarantined more than likely or whatever the case may be. Have some fun playing some board games if you have any. Or order one monopolies still like highly regarded. And a matter of fact, there was a, a, J a Jumanji board game after this movie that me and my cousin used to play back in the day. I doubt that she has it, but it's something like I want to look up one day. It's like it's like still like a Jumanji board game that you can probably buy off of uh, Amazon or eBay. Jurassic Park, man. Jurassic Park, man. The first one. And to some extent, the second one. Uh, it's still a great movie. Like I said in my Indiana Jones uh, the, uh, talk, uh, Jumanji is like a phenomenal movie. I'm not, yeah, Jumanji is a phenomenal I mean, Jurassic Park. Ju Jurassic Park is a phenomenal movie. Great Steven Spielberg film. Uh, one of his greats, easily. And just like the score, like uh, the, the lines. Literally, my favorite scene out of the entire movie was like I discussed this scene with, like, you know, a lot of people agree this is the first movie when they saw, uh, uh, Ian Malcolm played by uh, shoot, uh, um, crap, um, dang it, I keep forgetting these celebrities' names. Like so quickly in the middle of everything. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. It's like Jurassic Park.
Jeff Goldblum, my God. Jeff Goldblum, yes. Jeff Goldblum is like an amazing actor in this. Sam Neill as the archaeologist is just like, you know, uh, they sit down, sit down with the creator of Jurassic Park, uh, Hammond. And they're having this big discussion. It's probably one of my favorite films, uh, scenes in a film when you're just talking and it's just sitting down discussing like they thought this is going to suck. Like how you, can you bring back, like what are you going to be doing with like a, a, a dinosaur part? And <clears throat> yeah, and it's like, yeah, uh, after you saw all like the brontosauruses and like uh, the raptors, they sat down to eat and talk about what they saw so far, what they think. And it's like, Ian Malcolm, Jeff Goldblum's character, had like a very poignant, uh, you know, right at the game, poignant uh, topic, or not topic, but just his thoughts on it. And it's like, okay, uh, this is not a good idea. You, uh, uh, you brought, I mean, well, they all pretty much said it, uh, 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 agree on the same thing, on the same mirror. It's like, you brought back creatures that's been long since extinct by nature themselves, and they're in a time period they don't understand or know. Uh, uh, you know, their time has passed, and they're just animals pretty much just doing their thing, just like any other animal in an ecosystem, and you're putting them in a situation where a man who took over, and you pretty much uh, eroded the chain, the food chain, essentially, because dinosaurs was top of the food chain prior to human beings walking the earth. Now, we're at the top of the heap now, long, for a very long time, and you brought back a natural predator, literally a natural predator to humans that can pretty much eradicate us, uh, uh very easily, but not, not too easily because we have weapons and everything like that, but you got, you brought back T-Rexes and raptors that, that you try to prevent them from breeding by making them all females but life finds a way and and it's like you don't you don't understand what you're doing and it's like you're playing God and it's like you, you spared no expense on you know, I get it but make sure uh, his line which is I love quoting it's like you spend so much time uh, think about what you could do. You never took the time to think about what you sh uh, if you should. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's just like you know, this is a great you know idea. It's like one of those movies that pretty much have a discussion about like uh, like uh, someone playing God, and this is like a perfect example of like you probably should not do that. It never works out well for nobody who did that. Never. You're a human being taking something, and it's like when the uh, uh, female leads in the in the movie forgot her name. I want to say it's Bonnie Hunt, but I could be wrong. Saying like, you know, you brought back plants that's poisonous to them mostly, and uh, but you got them because it looks pretty. You don't understand what you're doing. You're pretty much a glorified uh, uh, low rent uh, Walt Disney. But you know, but my God, this movie is like so good, and it's like, like, come on, who hasn't seen the first Jurassic Park movie? Like those uh, Chris Pratt versions, it's not that good in my opinion, and like. Uh, of course, they did make sequels to the first Jurassic Park movie, Lost World and um, Jurassic Park 3, but a Lost World has its moments, but stick to the first Jurassic Park movie. That's, uh, uh, that's um, a whole lot better. One second.
Okay. Sorry. Let's take a minute here. So, excuse me. Sorry. Okay. All right. Now, I recommend this. I think I've recommended this to you, Daniel, uh, as a good uh, Robert Downey Jr. movie, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. This is like a, right before he was uh, cast into playing Iron Man. This is right before Iron Man. This is like a, essentially like a test run of seeing like after the whole deal, his deal was like, drugs and alcohol and stand in like prisons and stuff like that. This is like him, you know, proving himself like I can show up to work, I can do my job and stay clean and like I can still act my ass off. And this goes to show like, yeah, he could definitely do all that. He is very good in this. Robert Downey Jr. And this is, I think, uh, uh, Val Kilmer's last film before he had the issue with like uh, throat cancer. I think he was in the middle of dealing with, like, the first, you know, right in discovering about his throat cancer, probably more than likely, because he's, like, walking on canes for the most, for the latter half, or at least most of the movie, uh, walking on a cane, uh, while he's struggling to walk a little bit, and of course he was, like, uh, towards the end, I'm pretty sure he was, like, uh, wearing, like, an ascot around his throat, but, uh, yeah, and yeah, this movie was like phenomenal. It's like a nice, cool detective noir movie, which I usually do appreciate. I love films like this. So yeah, uh, this is an awesome film. I love Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, I watch every chance I get. Now another detective movie, man, Knives Out, man. This is a phenomenal movie. Uh, I. Uh, for months, I didn't spend time to go watch this movie in the theaters until maybe like the last month before it was uh finally uh uh, uh released from like uh, because before it was done in theaters, the the last month I took the time it was still showing it was in January of I say January of twenty twenty early twenty twenty. Of probably the first or second week of 2020 of January, that I went out to go to this theater to go see this movie because everybody was raving about this so much. And I was like, you know, let's go see this dog on Nice Out movie. I gotta see this for myself. And then luckily, it wasn't spoiled for me, but I wanted to go see it. Like, wow, this is solid. This is like a really good movie. The late Christopher Plummer, of course, and you got like all this other cast meets uh, mates here. Chris Evans, I mean, come on, you got Captain America, and it's like, and James Bond in the same movie. Come on, and a lot of these actors, these are like acclaimed actors and actresses in this film, and it's like they play off each other so well, and it's so much fun to see them uh, uh, do their thing. And it's like, like the Acting gravitas is just through the roof. Uh, but man, it's like knives out. I'm like, I'm, I'm so glad I wasn't spoiled for this because I, I've, I've slept on it for a couple of months before I decided to, like, you know what? I'll spend the ticket money. I'll go to the theater to go see it. Luckily, it, it was still in the theater before it was done. So, like, went out, got myself popcorn, went to the AMC, and, and, and like, uh, 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 right by like uh, this uh, four city mall that's in Chicago and um I went to go check it out and I was like wow you know the hype you know sometimes the hype uh it was more than uh than what the movie was able to like uh level up 
uh, live up to. But sometimes these are rare occasions when the hype matches perfectly with what the movie standards is. So, you know, the word of mouth was like well deserved. A uh, well deserved hype. Uh, definitely deserve. If you like murder mysteries, detective stuff, definitely check this out. Kung Fu Hustle, man. Yeah. Kung Fu Hustle is like a like a comedy, like not a spoof or anything like that or Kung Fu movies, but kind of in a way, but still play uh, not in that same manner. It was just like, I forgot what kind of it's obviously a martial arts uh, genre, but it's just like, it's like a very exaggerated version of that. But it's just very, very good, very hilarious. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long while, but man, it was like a talk of the town during high school. When I was in high school, everybody was talking about this movie. It's uh, very funny. It's like, uh, uh, there's a lot of good martial arts movies out there, like like The Raid or anything like that. But this one's like, you know, one of those good uh, comedic kind of martial arts films. Uh, it kind of took what Jackie Chan normally does and kind of like took it to a whole nother level with the comedy. It's like uh, uh, Dragon Ball Z, Dra Dragon Ball Z level goofiness to it. But man, this movie is solid. It's still solid. Uh, uh, and it's just uh, something that you definitely have to see for yourself. It's hard for me to describe because uh, I, I don't think I can do it justice. But you have to check this out. It's a great film, lovely film. A law abiding citizen, yeah. Jamie Fox and Gerard Butler, yeah. This one is uh, where I am. We call this confusion. Uh ha 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 ha. Very funny. Uh huh. We got a comedian in the house. We got Law Abiding Citizen. Yeah, this is pretty much like. Like, the Punisher was not in a superhero uh, universe. Draw Butler plays this guy who, who's enacting his revenge upon people involved. In some shape or form, with the killing of his wife and daughter, not only just the criminals themselves, but the the attorneys and judges involved, and Jamie Fox, who uh, plays his uh, his lawyer, uh, has to end up dealing w with him, and it's like a good thriller, just like a whole mind games kind of thing, because. You know, Draw Bell is playing like a like a very smart individual that's systematically killing a lot of people. And like you should see like the interesting ways he does it. I cannot describe it without spoiling it. You have to check it out yourself. I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh yeah, it's kinda like a if like a different universe with like uh the Punisher or something like that. Yeah, so like this, the same idea, the whole uh, mm -hmm. revenge uh, movie. The Lethal Weapon franchise. Yeah, this is like a. Ah, this is very good. I love the Lethal Weapon franchise. Uh, uh, the, I don't think I like the third all as much, but. It was either number two or number three I don't like as much. But definitely number one is solid. And like uh, peak Mel Gibson, I'm telling you right now. But it was the fourth one that's like a nice little wrap up because it's like rounded out with, uh, uh, well, Mel Gibson plays as Riggs who has this kind of like a gung-ho, you know, devil may care attitude that's like you know does all these crazy stunts without uh caring what might happen to him because he could easily get killed with a lot of stuff he pulls but uh Murtaugh played by Danny Glover is like that you know it's kind of like that whole uh cop 
your buddy cop thing. It's like he's a serious straight man trying to rein in this uh, cowboy. And uh, uh, he does his cowboy act just because he's kind of suicidal. You know, it's prior to the whole entire first movie, he lost his wife, so he's kind of like can't just all out kill himself. He's just trying to do his job as a cop, and hopefully one day uh, a crook will get lucky and take him out. But it's like as the franchise goes on, he grows a more appreciation of being around Marta and his family. And it wasn't until the fourth one where, uh, well, it kind of shows off like, okay, people getting older. And it's like, you cannot pull the same stunt like you used to when you were younger. I was like, you know, this is when, like, you know, Mel Gibson's, like, I guess, showing his, well, at least his character was showing his age by certain th Yeah, I think, because uh, this is Bruce Lee's one of his, like, I'm not saying it's the first American film, but it's one of his films that I ever seen him in because he's playing this very lethal martial artist. It's like a henchman to uh, one of the main bad guys. And this is one of the few Chris Rock films where he is not sidelined as a big character. He has a little bit, he's a supporting role, but still like a bigger role than he used to have been playing prior to this. But uh, yeah, and Jet Li was like, very young, and him kicking Mel Gibson's butt for the most part in his first movie, and um, and or at least uh, trying to take him out. And first part of the film, he's like realizing, like, you know, it wasn't too long ago I can easily keep up with this guy, and it's like, Murtaugh's like, yeah, welcome to getting older. Your body's, you know, slowing down a bit. You can't. Do the same crap that you used to, and um, yeah, him, you know, trying to come, I guess, you know, hitting that, you know, age of like, uh, you know, uh, midlife crisis kind of situation. But then, you know, this whole entire, this is like, this is like those the icon, or at least the perfect representation of the good buddy cop film, and. They did make uh, uh, a few years ago. They did make a uh, Lethal Weapon TV show that was short-lived, like at least lasted two or three seasons. I think two seasons uh, or three seasons, because like again, it's three seasons. They lasted because um, because uh, uh, Damon Wayans plays as Murtaugh in that, while uh, some actor I, I don't know his name was playing Riggs. Halfway through uh, season two, they, I guess, got into it on set, and you know the guy playing Riggs was acting, you know, uh, I guess like a jerk on set or just towards da uh, Damon Wayans in particular or something like that. I think it was just in general on set, and like uh, Damon Wayans wasn't having it, and it's like, uh, you know, they just wrote. They started with Damon Wayans because I guess he was acting like an ass on set. So they wrote, they killed off his character towards the end of season two. Then season three came by, they recasted uh, uh, the guy who played uh, uh, in the American Pie film, uh, Stifler. I keep forgetting his doggone name. Uh, hey, D. Lance. Aloha there. For the life of me, I, I okay. What is this freaking cast? For the life of me, what is that man's name? Sean William Scott. My God, thank you, thank you, Google. Uh, Sean William Scott. You know, uh, they replaced him with Sean William Scott. He was really good in that, but it's pretty much pretty much similar like to Riggs, but just not Riggs. So they they kind of ended the show after the and they wrapped up season three and it's like yeah and that was doomed to fail eventually I'm surprised they managed to last as long as they did but yeah Lethal Weapon franchise uh, very good franchise and I'm surprised they made four of these doggone things but yeah at least they introduced introduced us to Jet Li for the first time in this movie The Lion King, yeah, definitely upper echelon of classic Disney films. Animated, 
not the stupid uh, live action version, which apparently, because I didn't see it myself, but apparently they just did everything similar. So they took out things like the Scar song, Be Prepared. And like, uh, apparently, Beyonce who plays Grown Up Nala at that part when she's supposed to bring Simba, when she finds Simba and wants them to bring him back, they're supposed to sing Can You Feel the Love Tonight? And it was daytime, and the song didn't even last that long. Or at least, you know, you know, they didn't... It's like, they copy everything except for the few key moments that's supposed to mean something. But it's like, this live action stuff, the cartoon had the benefit of full expression. You can't do that with real animals. At least CGI animals, you can't do that that well. It's just like it, it was. The movie was pissed for, but this is something that you should show your kids. Okay, this is a true Lion King film. Everything about it is fantastic. The music is fantastic. The you know, uh, the uh, the arts, uh, uh, like you know, everything about it is just like. It's just like with the Aladdin and Hunchback of Notre Dame or uh, One and One Dalmatians, these Renaissance level uh, Disney movies, Hercules, they uh, they are good as is. You cannot just recreate things. It's similar but live action. It does usually does not work that well. I think they're technically their best ones probably Cinderella, not Cinderella. Uh, Maybe Beauty and the Beast was probably slightly better out of all that crap they try to remake. They supposed to remake Hercules and Hunchback of Notre Dame, which they probably be a little bit more successful with. But given f the fact that what happened to Mulan, which will be coming up, or we'll be talking about that too on this list, they uh, they might not even do that well, and they're working with live action people. So it's like, you know. Y'all need to cut y'all losses. It's not going to work. Leave these things alone. They're masterpieces on their own. They don't need any kind of redone or redub or remake or whatever. But Lion King, set your kids down. Watch this. If you haven't seen this in a while, come back to it. It still holds up. Lost Boys. Another good vampire movie. This is like peak 90s. Well, not peak 90s. It was like when grunge and goth, you know, meat. But, yeah, this is like a, a very good uh, movie. This is like a, a perfect... I mean, it, it has edges, but it's like... It's just hard to say that it's got any cons to it, because it's like the whole uh, feel and atmosphere to this movie is just phenomenal. It's just like, you know... Uh, you have to see for yourself for me to like, because like most movies, I don't want to uh, show, because uh, me describing it don't do it justice. This is like a fantastic film. Love every minute of it. Uh, watch it on Halloween. Usually movies like this, you got to watch at night. Come on. Uh, uh, just to really get into it. You want to watch this with your significant other. It's a great movie uh, to watch with like uh, your significant other. Just a uh, Nice little Netflix and not Netflix and chill. I want to say that because Netflix and chill implies that the movie's bad and you don't really care. But this is something that you just want to sit down and chill with your significant other and just relax on the couch or whatever. This is like that kind of movie for you, and this is like a good interpretation of a vampire, a vamp, a good vampire movie. Uh, Memoirs of the Invisible Man, another '80s film. Yeah, one of the uh, Invisible Man movies I watched as a kid, uh, uh, Chevy Chase was like, you know, him and Bill Murray, they, like, they was like top of the heap when it comes to like good, you know, 80s actors. It's like with him and them and uh, Eddie Murphy. Uh, but yeah, Memoirs of the Invisible Man is just like another interpretation of the Invisible Man movie. This, the Hollow Man was more like a different kind of science chemistry and injecting yourself to make you invisible. This movie is more so accidental science gone wrong, where like 
some kind of disruption in like some kind of system in a building where he was supposed to be in like on some kind of a uh, uh, lecture to uh, come oversee some kind of thing in this building and something went wrong and the building instead of blowing up it like turned anything inside invisible and parceled the building until eventually it disappeared on its own completely gone evaporated and he's trying to find the scientists involved so he can try and figure his way to turn back visible but this movie is very good and uh and another good Invisible Man movie that I do highly recommend. Man in Black. I didn't put all three on this list, but it's like a collab in a way, because I don't like the third one, but the first Man in Black movie is just like, a, still holds up an incredible film. The sequel is a dip in quality, but I still enjoy what it is. They probably should have just left it at that, but I don't know. Um, I think they still thought it was a cash cow on some level, uh, but they was pretty much milking a dead horse or dead cow or whatever. But yeah, Man in Black, the first one, Tom Lee Jones and Will Smith, like I said, peak Will Smith era, like the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, peak Will Smith. He was ruling like, uh, like the early 2000s stuff. And, uh, that around Wild Wild West and Hitch, good Will Smith films in his in their own right too. Uh, definitely check those out. But uh, Man in Black is I I be remiss not putting this on my uh, favorite non superhero films of all time. But Man in Black is very good. Aliens like you know secret government agency that's monitoring aliens. The TV show they had a TV show Man in Black TV show that still was pretty good. I, I might want to check it out, review it, maybe, because it was like a couple of, at least two or three seasons at the very least. I'd like to say it was two seasons. But really good stuff, man. And it's like, in it, the TV show really built upon uh, this universe they made when it's like, you got uh, this agency that just deals with uh, intergalactic threats here on Earth and then outside coming in. And just policing, like pretty much it's like S.H.I.E.L.D. in a way, or S.W.O.R.D. and S.H.I.E.L.D. in the Marvel comics, but combined. And it's like just monitoring extra extraterrestrial threats. And solid movie. I love this film. And, you know, another, technically another buddy cop film, another, a young brass dude with the older veteran cop and trying to uh, deal with, you know, threats. But the TV show definitely built upon that. They tried to do a uh, uh, another sequel, but with two different people, called you know Man in Black International, which stars uh, Chris Hemsworth and uh, uh, the person who played Valkyrie in the Thor Ragnarok. I forgot her, Tessa Thompson, and um, just it's weird because they have great chemistry. I'm surprised that. This really didn't show that movie didn't show that off too well, and uh, the, the movie kind of bombed, which is sad because like it's like it could have been great, could have been like a great idea. Just you have you know Men in Black in America, but what about MIB over in like the UK or um, in China or Japan? It's like there's all their different. Uh, areas in the U.S. that probably have to monitor stuff. There's not everything in center in New York, so that was a good idea. But the execution, I wouldn't say it was horrible. It's not the horrible thing in the world, but I went to the theater to go see it because I like those two actors. But it's just like it could have been done so much more, and it's like I don't know where exactly where they dropped the ball on that. But the first Man in Black movie, highly recommend it. Holds up pretty well, especially love those kind of buddy cop stuff. But yeah, uh, of course you got them fighting a fighting uh, an alien cockroach. I mean, and the thing's freaky as hell. And I mean, like when I first saw that, I, I literally had like a nightmare for like days. I mean, like man, this is like intense. I didn't 
my father and my cousins went to go see this movie in theater. They tried to convince me to go with them. I chickened out because I saw the trailers to this and it freaked me out. This I didn't want to see that thing on big screen. They went out to go to KFC or Dunkin' Donuts. I'd like to say it was KFC afterwards when the movie was over. But I was kind of bummed out. I was like, oh, you got food and you didn't give me none because I didn't want to go to your freaking, to the freaking movie because I didn't want to be scared. I mean, like... Why? Why would you do that? And you coming home eating a big ass piece of chicken in front of my face. Come on. But yeah, I mean, every time I see that movie, I remember that moment that my father took my, you know, my little brother and my cousins to see that movie because they wanted to see it. And like, they knew I don't like scary crap and they teased me relentlessly for it because I, because I don't like scary crap. I don't like to be scared. Why would that be a bad thing? Miami Vice, another buddy cop thing. This is pretty much around that time when like old cop shows or uh, old TV shows that was good back in like was like top notch back in the eighties and the seventies, and they bringing these kind of things back. Miami Vice it was actually a pretty solid film. I didn't see it in the theaters. I watched it on uh, DVD, but Miami Vice, Colin Farrell and J uh, Jamie Fox were great in this film and it's like uh it was made by michael mann i think that was the director's name something man with two ends and uh it was it was great uh, i i love this movie i watched it a few times and it's just like uh yeah you you get the feel of what Miami is and nightlife in this, and it's like, uh, yeah, this Vice Squad, and it's like this, this is like a a cool cop movie, so uh, definitely check this out. Miami Vice is very good. Here we go, the Mission Impossible franchise. I couldn't just put individually. I want to combine these because there's something to talk about here. Now, I like them all. Now, the first one still holds up, and I think that's technically better than all of them. Something about the first one still holds up compared to uh, everything that came after it, but all the rest of them were pretty, pretty solid, except for the second one. Mission Impossible 2 sucked. It's probably like the worst one out of the entire one, but everything else was very, very good. Now, you know, the, recent, the one he did with Henry Cavill, where he had to keep his mustache, even though he was dealing with a uh, situation in Justice League, and he's still Superman, but they had to CGI his mustache and everything like that. That was a whole thing. Uh, uh, but uh, Tom Cruise, man, like, this dude really, I mean, it's nothing wrong with doing your own stunts if you're capable, but dude, like, what is he, like, almost 60? And it's like, you're, you're young looking, and you aged well. But you don't have that kind of, I mean, I mean like, he runs a lot in his movie. He does, he try to top himself in everything he does in each of these movies. Trying to, the, the next one, he's supposed to be filming in space. Uh, it's like, and, and NASA's helping him do that so he can film this a, a particular a particular scene in the next Mission Impossible movie in space, which is wild. I'm interested, yeah. But it's like, Dude, you're not a young man anymore. You gotta pull back a bit. You take your ego out of the equation here. It's like you're mortal man. And it's like you already broke your leg in the last film. Not broke it, but it's like you hurt your leg trying to jump off mobility to the next with a harness, yeah. But it's like you seen clips of that on YouTube of Tom Cruise uh a missing impossible uh, behind the scenes uh, leg issue. You see him like trying to hop over, and you can hear his leg. You know, I think it was his left or right leg. It was one of the two. One of his legs bump up against. He just barely uh, uh, got over that other building, but you hear a loud uh, thump of uh, his like hitting the edge of the building that he was trying to hop over. And I was like, dude. Like, you're gonna fall apart. Uh, uh, take a 
down a notch, okay? It's like, but like, uh, and he's always trying to top himself. And it's like, on other occasions, that uh, uh, will be uh, not a big deal. Just be, you know, just be safe and everything like that. But it's like a person your age, or at least getting to that age, you're not gonna be able to do this stuff. And I'm surprised the Mission Impossible franchise is even keeping it's lasting longer as it is. It's pretty much. Uh, I'm pretty sure it probably has about as much m films as the Star Wars films at this point, and like he's gonna have to end it. I thought it was gonna be done after three, but uh, uh, he's gonna have to like uh, stop at some point because uh, as great as these films are, he's gonna have to like you know. Uh, make a perfect wrap up eventually but I do recommend watching all these Mission Impossible films they're great except for the second one watch the second one at your own peril it's probably not the worst film ever but compared to all the other Mission Impossible f films uh, to it it's very very low tier and uh, but yeah Definitely check out the Mission Impossible franchise. Mortal Kombat! Oh my god. Oh, the first Mortal Kombat movie. Keep in mind, uh, not the second one. The second one is shit. But uh, Mortal Kombat. Uh, part of the, like, there's other video game movies that I think is very uh, uh, good. But for a long time, the first Mortal Kombat movie is the only one that, for the longest time, was the only successful video game movie made. Despite it being PG-13 and not R, because, I, I don't know, at the time, you know, not a lot of people was working on this, respected that, you know, it had to be R, just like blood and gore, but they're worried about kids watching this and, you know, mothers, you know, will be freaking out. Things like that. So, uh, but it still holds up. Still good movie for what it is. And everybody involved was like, was phenomenal. The guy who played Raiden, uh, not Raiden, uh, uh, Sang Sung, he plays that role uh, perfectly. He, every chance he gets, he doesn't, uh, no matter how, he's up there in age a bit, but he, because there was like a, short uh, YouTube uh, uh, show uh, built upon, upon um, bringing back the Mortal Kombat uh, Terminant and things like that and uh, 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 about say Ryu, uh, Liu Kang uh, 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 after a generation that passed, you know, found love and lost her and and became jaded and started working for like the bad guys uh you know with the influence of Shang Tsung fighting for him kind of thing you gotta check it out it's on YouTube but I'm looking forward to that freaking new trailer of the Mortal Kombat movie I can't not wait it's coming out in April this year around my birthday I'm gonna be excited I'm definitely gonna watch that movie I cannot wait and it's gonna be rated R staying true to the uh franchise in the video game they did like a, a time travel reboot kind of thing since Mortal Kombat 9 and carried on through that way, uh, which I will bring up when I do my video game uh, discussion uh, uh, later. But uh, Mortal Kombat, first one, holds up very well. There will be a few more on this list that I think uh, deserves uh, respect as far as like uh, great ones. I don't think I have uh, the first Tomb Raider movie on this list. It's fun for what it is. I do want to give that an honorable mention. Uh, the rebooted Tomb Raider movie with a different actress, not Angelina Jolie. You know, she did well in her own right during the early mid 2000s when she played the character. But the rebooted version that came out a few years ago, uh, I'm blanking on no lady's name. But if you look up uh, the recent uh, uh, Tomb Raider movie yourselves, 
uh, that movie was a solid movie, and I think they're supposed to be uh, making like a sequel to that. That one was actually a solid movie. Uh, very good. It's pretty much trying to base it on the first rebooted uh, uh, Tomb Raider video game. Uh, the one that uh, she and a crew of scientists got trapped on an island while they was trying to do some research and record and all that stuff. Just like the whole Tomb Raider uh, thing was completely uh, rebooted to a modernized era, not the big boobed version of Tomb Raider. This is like a, a very, you know, uh, you know, but not petite, but it's just like an ordinary looking depiction of what to, uh, 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 Lower Croft would look like. That's what the reboot is based off of that, and that's what everybody's been going off of from the past uh, few years that is current Tomb Raider. And that is a solid video game movie in of itself. I just thought I want to mention that, that rebooted Tomb Raider movie. Check that out as well. Check out Mortal Kombat solid video game movies. I just want to put it out there now. Moana. You're talking about something that can easily rival uh, Frozen. Moana is definitely up there. You're talking about like, you know, perfect representation of like, uh, like, I'm pretty sure it's more uh, Maui. Uh, 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 not Maui. Uh, the, uh, like Island of New Zealand and like the uh, uh, Maori warrior, uh, uh, or at least Maori civilization, civilization of the time, and it's like I love this movie. It's a great film. The music is awesome. The water effects on its own is just. I mean, you can look at it on the poster. It's a still, but if you watch the movie on its own and watch the water effects. It is phenomenal creation with graphics. It's just, I, I never saw it before. It's just like perfect wave motion. And they took their time to perfect water effects. That is just like, it's clear Fiji water kind of stuff. And it's not like just blue water. And it's not your basic blue water. This is like real, like, it feels like real water, and it's just like amazing. And you know, Dwayne the Rock Johnson as uh, Maui is great with his tattoos. Look like the Rock, obviously. He got a like Rock, big dude with a uh, hook. And then this young lady, I, I can't pronounce her name for the life of me, uh, but the lady who voiced Moana, great singer in her own right. But I kind of want a versus. I tweeted this uh, a week or so ago. Uh, that, you know those music versus battles, they have like uh, Keisha Cole and Asante they did like, a little while back and stuff like that I want a, a Disney music versus battle with Moana versus uh, Elsa from Frozen and have those two do a uh, uh, versus battle between those two that would be awesome I'm all here for that, I want to hear that because th these two actresses can sing man they can sing and this is, I think, this is a little bit better than Frozen because they have the right amount of songs and the right amount of story. They don't make a song after every little thing that they do. Uh, you meet this pig, the pig doesn't have a song every time you meet the pig. Uh, you meet this rooster, the rooster doesn't have a song every time you jump in. If it was Frozen, every time you meet like a character, they have their own little, little step up thing they gotta do. Uh, all of a sudden, it's like. We don't have time for that. I was like, we want to get to the story. Now every, now every interaction deserves their own little uh, West Side Story element to it. Come on. But definitely recommend uh, Moana. It's on Disney Plus if you have Disney Plus or whatever streaming service. Check it out. If it's on TV, check it out. It's usually up on TV, usually around uh, on, t on TBS. Was it TBS? I like to say TBS uh, uh, channel, and it's usually uh, during the holiday season. During the holiday season, like November uh, into December, they really chuck out all those Disney movies because usually it's supposed to be just all Christmas stuff. But if they 
they put in Toy Story and like, Mo Moana and Frozen and all this stuff, and it's like, you know, just throw them all in there in the mix. So usually we'll more than likely see Moana more, Moana more often during that time, but if you manage to see it on TV on random, check it out. It's very good. Or if you get eventually Disney Plus, check it out. It's very good. Mulan. What can I say about Mulan, man? It's just one of my favorites. This is like second, right behind Aladdin for me. Mulan is fantastic. The live action did not do it justice whatsoever. And it's a crying shame. Especially since you have Min Nan Wen, uh, who voiced Mulan in this, who rep not reprised the role, but was cast uh, as like a cameo in the live action version. And it's like, you're wasting all these great Asian actors and actresses. You're wasting their time and their skill uh, to do this crappy, uh, low rent version of Mulan, and it's like I know he's trying to make it a really realistic depiction of the story of Mulan, but you still fell at that too. You could have done so much with it, and you still added magic to it, but you couldn't be bothered to include yeah, magic phoenix, which is not in this at all. But you couldn't. I mean, I don't care about Mushu like that. You can leave him in or out, but at the very least. Keep the song of Make a Man Out of You. If nothing else, they hummed the freaking song, but it was only like a minute. And it's like, oh my God, you, you ruined, like, you're, you're now basically just ruining it. And on top of that, a lot of people who uh, wanted to, like, watch it early, since they already had Disney Plus, can just spend $30 uh, extra just to see it early uh, before it comes out a month or two later automatically for free and it's like you wasted people's extra thirty dollars on crap not that like people involved was totally crap but it's just like everything around it is just like it was piss poor this is a right Mulan still the best uh, Mulan uh, movie uh, definitely check it out Mulan uh, uh, Eddie Murphy as Mushu uh, you got uh, B.D. Wong as, like, the Emperor's son, uh, uh, Shang, I think it was Shang, that uh, uh, started the song. It's like, to this day, I literally have on my list of liked stuff on uh, my uh, YouTube is Make a Man I Use on that list. Because it's a great song. I love that song. I love a lot of it songs in um, Mulan uh, but that one is up there for me. Mulan deserves everybody respect. It's a great movie and was made the live action worse because just like with the sequel to Frozen and like uh, a lot of Disney uh, female led movies the biggest problem is what I saw from other reviews which I concur is the fact that uh, the purpose of the, the original uh, animated, ver animated version of Mulan is the fact that you see her, if you've seen this movie before, you see her not know about how to fight. The live action version made her just perfect at every doggone thing. I was like, oh, so your line of thinking is like, I don't, we don't want, you know, people thinking we're misogynists. Uh, so we better have these women perfect out the gate with no problems that she's just perfect. She's good at everything because we cannot have women struggle because what might look bad on us. I was like, dude, it's perfectly fine to have a woman who might not know certain things. Women don't know everything in the book. That's why they go to school or, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, be an apprentice to something. Because they will learn and be good at it later. That's what the purpose of Mulan, at least one of the reasons Mulan joined the army, because she can like train so she can fight for her father's honor and do it for him rather than him being hurt because she loved her father so much. She fought for him despite being a woman. And 
that spirals into like a you know, better thing because you see her struggle and learn and, and overcome things. Your character, man or woman, has to of, of overcome struggle. It's not just a man thing, and women shouldn't be treated so daintily. They're not little perfect little glass objects you keep in a box to keep them from breaking. They can be strong too. They can struggle too. That's how you learn and grow. You miss the mark completely because you're trying to be all told too woke about it. And it's like you, you miss the mark completely. That's why, like, I do not uh, recommend you watch the live action version at all. Don't waste your time with it. Watch the animated version of Mulan. is much much better. It's very good voice acting. Very cool visuals. Uh, the villain's phenomenal. Not the you know, I want to say he's not the best villain. He's a great villain, but he's not in that upper echelon of Disney villains like Scar or Hades. But, you know, it's a great film. Highly recommend Mulan. And this is probably one of the lesser known uh, Michael Keaton films, but I do have a fondness of uh, multiplicity. Pretty much uh, an overworked. Uh, father and husband who was working on this uh, he's an architect and he's working on this building for this uh, scientist who clones people or at least is in the a field of cloning and then you know just to help him out he clones Michael Keaton but then it, uh, trying to you know, you know trying to uh, divide up work in his life so he can have more family time, but then uh, then it got a little carried away, then he cloned himself for at least two more times extra. So now it's, uh, he plays his character Doug, so now it's four Dougs. And every time he clones himself, well, at least not himself, but if you make a clone of a clone, like a Xerox of a Xerox, the next one might not be as good as the first one. And you can see that play out as like, uh, the next one doesn't know as much as the last, and the last one is a little uh, 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 men a little me uh, mentally slow a bit. So, but that, but each one he you know Michael Keaton plays off, he plays like a rugged version of himself. Uh, it's all business. Then he got this little sensitive side version of himself that doesn't know the business all that well. He's losing it. You know, bits of him every time he uh, gets Xerox. Then you got just just a, a slower version of him. But each version he plays, he does a, like a, a very good acting uh, ability, which just placated to like you know just normal Doug, rugged Doug, sensitive Doug, and like slow Doug. And each one is just great. It's hilarious. Great film. Like just a good '90s film. If you want to check it out, uh, yeah. Just a, a nice, just a nice film. It's very good. Murder on the Orient Express, another good uh, detective movie. I uh, didn't go see it in the films. I saw it uh, uh, when it was on TV eventually, but uh, it has like a great star studded cast. Uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh, Penelope, Penelope. Uh, Penelope. Penelope Cruz, William Dafoe, Judy Dench, Johnny Depp, Josh Gad, uh, Leslie Odom, uh, Leslie Odom Jr., Michelle Pfeiffer, and Daisy Ridley. Talk about just surround yourself with just phenomenal, phenomenal actors. Just like with Knives Out, these, uh, which I kind of want to see, like, like, uh, 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 Kenneth Branagh's character, who's the detective, I want to see him up against the uh, detective in Nines Out, uh, who played by Daniel Craig, and and those two like, you know, like death battle or something like that. It's like just them two like having like a, a detective off, or at least who can solve like a murder before the other. But uh, yeah. But it, it, it murder on Orient Express pretty much based off a book. If you have read the book, I here is very good. I haven't read it myself, 
but uh, I'm pretty sure it's on on Audible. But yeah, this is like a very very good movie. Just center on this train by itself, and you, you know nobody's going anywhere until the uh, killer is found. It's supposed to be a sequel to this, uh, a different cast, but uh, except for Kenneth Brenner, who's reprising his role as the uh, detective. So. I'm looking forward to that. I'm pretty sure the sequel is going to be based off of a, uh, a sequel to the book itself, because the murder on the Orient Express is probably like the first book. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, highly recommend this film. As I mentioned in my previous video, Nightmare Before Christmas, not directed by Tim Burton, but uh, I think he helped wrote some of this stuff or produced it, and it's very good. It's a highly, highly recommended movie. Halloween feel is a good Christmas and Halloween film. They're both in this, so uh, they should share the accolades of being a Halloween, a good Halloween movie and a good Christmas movie. Highly recommend this. Uh, you know, the great songs, and it's like, I mean, come on now. You cannot, you cannot tell me you don't jam up to like, this is Halloween, this is Halloween, 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 Halloween. So, it's good. I, I love Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a phenomenal movie. Highly recommend it. Everybody loves this. I, you know, I'd be hard pressed to meet somebody who haven't seen this movie unless you're a baby. So, uh, next one. The Oceans franchise. This, in particular, in my favorite, will be Oceans 11, 12, and 13. Not uh, the female version. I didn't see it, but it did not do very well. Uh, but uh, these, like, this is like another great heist movie that I really love. And you're talking about, like, you know, you got George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, uh, uh, Bernie Mac, uh, uh, well, the others I I cannot recall their names, but I seen them in plenty of stuff. One of them was related to uh, um, uh, Ben Affleck, uh, but I did not know that until like uh, another movie that will be coming up pretty soon called Tyra Heist. That it wasn't until that movie I did not realize because he's in that too. And I realized he was related to Ben Affleck. But I think he's his cousin because they got the same facial structure. But he's just a little skinnier than Ben Affleck uh, compared to Ben Affleck being very buff. Not like too buff, but buff. He got buff for Batman, so he's kind of buff. But uh, yeah, the Olsen movie is a great heist film. Uh, you really. Yeah. Carl. Yeah. yeah. I need you to come help me. Okay. <laughs> 